Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, first, I'm really um, sorry that <laughs> I can only stay for another very long time because um, I have to go to go back to New York. There's a meeting in New York City that I have to be there. I wish I could stay longer because the theme of this meeting is very much closely related to um, what's happening to um, my own interest. <coughs> Um, but I'm really sorry, so I'll come back um, this next spring and stay longer. But uh, that's a different program, I assume. Um, so I'm going to be talking about multi-scale modeling. And the key question is, how do we construct interpretable and truly reliable um, models? And you can see there's a lot of activity going on. You know, there's, if you look at the poster, you know, there's lots of things happening. Um, so it's now fairly easy, not such a uh, difficult task. Students can do it almost uh, automatically uh, to get s a bunch of data and fit the data very nicely with neural networks or something like that. But then what? So can we, try, you know, how, what do we do about this? What, what, what does that mean? <coughs> so let me begin, <coughs> so this is my outline, but let me begin with, no, let me wait for Stan to sit down. <laughs> I was very disappointed he wasn't going to come. <coughs> Okay, so let me start with multi-scale modeling. This is something that I devoted like at least 20 years on. So the idea is that we, as an applied math person, as a math person, we don't like these ad hoc stuff in the modeling process. For example, turbulence models, um, you know, very dirty, you know, unreliable. I mean, I'm, I'm putting it very badly, but, but in some sense, it's, you know, there's a lot of work that's gone into it and it's, done produce uh, lots of progress. But on the other hand, from our viewpoint, it's not clean. There's lots of ad hoc stuff. You have to rely on experience, tuning, a lot of stuff. So we don't like that. And we want to do principled modeling, new ad hoc stuff, and accurate, reliable models. So that's the motivation for doing model scale modeling. And typically, we're interested in large scale systems. And in, in here, if you look at a plastic, you know, pl plasticity problem, there's not very many reliable models. But on the other hand, we all know quantum me mechanics, at least the Schrodinger equations, is truly reliable. So the idea is, can we produce models that would work on this scale, but using, re you know, relying purely on information that at, uh, models at this scale? You can do that either, so there are two ways to do it. Sorry. You can either do sequential modeling, which is they try to pre-compute pre your model, and then it's just as good as your PDE, your Navier-Stokes equation at a macro scale. That's pre-computing. That's called sequential multi-scale modeling. And the other way to do it is to do it on the fly. So this, this, is, a, this is about compute, getting a new model. This is about uh, an algorithm that al allows you to couple the macro scale system of interest with micro-scale models on the fly. So this is called concurrent coupling. So the typical example, you know, it's, you really you want to work at the macro scale. You have a model which you don't really know. There's lots of components in this model, for example, Reynolds stress, you don't really know. And you're supposed to compute that from some sort of micro-scale model. So this is a schem schematic for what, what is called heterogeneous multi-scale method that Bjorn Anquist and I developed. But the essential the same spirit goes to other multi-scale algorithms, for example, quasi-continuum, um, equation-free that Jan has developed. A key component here is this data estimation. You're missing some part of data, Reynolds stress. You're supposed to estimate that data from the microscale scale model. And this is, can, you can do this if there are only like five, maybe five is already too big, but two or three degrees of freedom. Then you can do this estimation. But if there are millions of degrees of freedom, you need to estimate. And this is particularly the case when there is no scale separation like turbulence. Then you don't know how to do it. This was the obstacle starting from the beginning. I already talked about this example, this difficulty 20 years ago. And we didn't know, for a long time, we didn't know how to do, do that. And this is where the machine learning comes to the rescue. So now with machine learning, our objective has changed, namely, we want, to talk, we want to develop multi-scale models, just the program I described, for situations where there's no scale separation, turbulence. And we also want our model to be 
truly reliable, just like your Schrodinger equation. It shouldn't be just you know works only for your little data you generated, but it should be a, like you know a new phys physical navy Stokes or Schrodinger equation. So this is what we want to do, and let's see how far we can uh, go with this. So first, I want to put up uh, the notion of sequential versus concurrent learning. I was just talking about sequential versus concurrent multi-scale modeling. So here I want to say that there are two situations of in interest. One is the usual situation where you get your data first, and then you use the data to do some model, to, to do some machine learning. And this is typically the case in artificial intelligence, image processing, computer vision. You first prepare the data, and preparing the data is already a huge amount of work. ImageNet is a good example. That, and then with the data, you do mo some learning. So this I call sequential, because you first do data and, do, and then do learning. In the other scenario, is that you generate the data on the fly as learning proceeds. In the beginning, as it starts, there's no data. So you generate data, and you, then you do the modeling, so interactively. So this is the scenario that we'll be emphasizing. And this, I want to put up this because this is, number one, this is a little bit different from what people you in machine learning that used to do. Number two, that there's a lot of more interesting questions that happens here. And this is particularly from a mathematical viewpoint, there are more interesting questions. I want to compare this with active learning. So you, in a way, you would say that sequential learning is that you have both the data and the label beforehand. Active learning is that you have the unlabeled part, and then you decide from these unlabeled data which ones you're supposed to label, and then do the learning. So this is what is called active learning. So concurrent learning is that you don't have anything to start with, nothing. And generating these guys, not just the label, but also the data itself, is expensive. So you want to generate, uh, generate the optimal data. So this is a much more interactive process. So procedure to do that, so this is um, a procedure that, that we proposed in, uh, in, in, uh, in last year. By the way, well, okay, I, I would say if you look at the literature, there are spirits of this you know, everywhere. It's not like this is completely new, okay? But we uh, decided to put down this procedure. Namely, you, should, you would start, let's start out with no data, no model, no data, nothing. And then you first explore, you would explore the configuration space or state space that you're interested in, and then decide which one of these configurations need to be labeled. And then you do the labeling, and then you do the training. Now, the, this sounds like the usual thing to do, but the important part is that this exploration is in, interacts with the model that you have trained. So we'll see how to do that. This is a little, um, little more interactive than active learning. So this is the cycle. So it's, you have, yeah, okay, this is what I just said. Now, let me just mention that so you, there are several questions. First, well, this is very, uh, very uh, sensitive. So the first question is, how do we explore? The second question is, how do we decide which configuration that needs to be labeled? So let me now mention a trick that's used, I would say that's used um, in active learning, which is the following little trick. Namely, so here the idea is that you should label the data where there's not enough data. So if you see a little new configuration, you decide whether you should label the data. Label the data means that you need to do a microscopic physics computation. For example, you need to do quantum mechanics kind of computation of that configuration. So that's very expensive. Okay? And you, how do you decide whether you should label this new configuration? Well, the principle is that you should label it when there's not enough data. If there's not enough data, then the model that you already have would not be accurate enough. Okay? So if you generate, if you train an ensemble of models, an ensemble means like four or five models, and if, the, if there's already enough data and your model is already accurate enough, all these models would predict the same thing for this new configuration. So if the variance between the predictions are big, that means there's not enough accuracy, not enough data, so then you should label that data. So this is a simple trick that people in active learning use, and we adopt, adopt, adopt here. So let me give you some examples now. The first is molecular dynamics. Molecular dynamics, 
we want to study the dynamics of a system of atoms. So this could be a big molecule or could be an, an, a material. And by solving Newton's equation for the nuclei. So this is simple enough. The difficulty here is how to get the force. The force is given by a potential, so this will be the potential energy surface. And that's a function of all the positions of all the atoms that are present. So if you have a million atom, this will be a function of three million variables. And that's truly a large dimensional, high dimensional function. So traditionally, there are two ways to do it. One is developed by my collaborator, Roberto Carr and Pernello, and that's, that's to do, you know, to can compute these forces on the fly and couple that by, by coupling with quantum mechanics, usually density functional theory. So this is actually one of the most impressive concurrent multi-scale modeling example, actually. So this is great, except that this is very expensive, so you can handle 100 atom. The other extreme is that, forget about quantum mechanics, let's just try to cook up a potential you know, empirical potential that should model our system. For example, this is the well-known uh, Leonard Jones potential, but there are much more complicated potentials. EAM, terms of <coughs> Brenner, and all that stuff. So this is very efficient, much more efficient than this, but then it's not very reliable. So this is the where you need to do a lot of tricks and you, 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 know, you call intuition or your experience, or whatever. But in the end, there's still not very reliable, particularly considering the fact that the, mo the data that goes into these models are very limited. So now the new with machine learning, we have a new paradigm, which is to say, well, quantum mechanics just provides our data. We don't use quantum mechanics as a data generator. We use machine learning to parameterize the model, which would be in the spirit of this guy. And then, and then we just simulate with the molecular dynamics. This is simple enough. OK, so here is a little setup. We have these atoms, at n atoms. Each one of these are the coordinates of each atom. And for each atom, we define a little neighborhood. So RC is a cutoff radius that we specified beforehand. So for now, what I'm talking about is only useful when the, you know, the long range core interaction is not so important. So we're just working out the long range part, but it's not published. So this is, you think about this, the system only has short, reasonably short range interactions. So then everything, the action is in, in, in the little uh, neighborhood with the cutoff radius RC. Okay. And then for <coughs> each atom has its own little environment. So here is the network structure that was first proposed by Bella Pernello, 2007, when neural networks were not that popular. So you have these item, atoms. Each one of these atoms has a sub-neural network. And for each atom, the sub-neural network, the input are the, neighbor, are the coordinates of the neighbors in that, for that atom. And then you're supposed to do some fitting, you know, neural whatever stuff, in the end come up with the accurate energy. So this is the basic network structure. It, it's, it, it's by having this network structure it enforces <coughs> that this system is additive. So linear scaling. If you have more atoms, you just produce. I just ask, those yeah. are shared. Yeah, the, the neighbors are shared. Yeah. So the, the neural networks. Neural or well, if the it's same atom is shared. shared. If it's the same atom, it's shared, but if it's different, it's not, right? So there's a little bit of difference between oxygen atom and, and um, hydrogen atom. Oh, so there's atom-specific functions. Right, right, okay. right. But you, I think... You, you, you don't even necessarily know, right? You're going to give, like, the feature... I think, you, you, I think in the end, we, we, it's shared. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I'm not that 100% sure now. Okay, so the first point I want to make is that preserving symmetry is very important. Here, besides the usual translation and rotational symmetry, there's a new symmetry, which is a permutational symmetry. Namely, if you have two copper atoms, you label this one and label this two, and vice versa, it's the same system. So things, things do not change. And that's indeed, so that's a permutation symmetry between the labeling. So <coughs> that shows up very dramatically here. So if you don't impose permutation symmetry, the training error just doesn't go to zero. It flats out. And if you impose permutation symmetry, then it goes down nicely. Okay. So <coughs> another important point to make is that you should train with both energies and forces. It's, if you just train with energy, that's also um, harder. So this is the first uh, remark. You should really put in permutation symmetry. 
The simplest way to put in permutation symmetry is to fix, first of all, well, there's more than permutation symmetry. There's translation, rotation, and permutation. So for translation and rotation, you can fix that by impose a local coordinate system for each atom. You fix the atom you are looking at it as the origin, and then somehow define, define a, a frame. So that would fix the uh, rotation and translation symmetry. For permutation symmetry, one way to do it is just to have a way to order them in the little neighborhood. Uh, that's sort of a poor man's version of fixing the symmetries. And that works out here when you look at the training errors and the testing errors, that looks good. But when you put that into molecular dynamics and run for a long time, then you see a systematic drift of the energy. That's because in the process of uh, labeling, uh, ordering the atoms in the neighborhood, th this is done by looking at the distance between the neighbor and the atom you're looking at. And suddenly the distance can change. And that change changes the order uh, suddenly. So that introduces a little discontinuity. That dis little discontinuity gives a little force, thermal force, into the system and causes the energy to drift up. That's not good. So really, we have to enforce the symmetry in the right way. And the, re the way to do it is, <coughs> is the following. So first of all, if you for these, R, uh, these RJI, there are the RI minus RJ. So, so these are the relative position. So we're looking at the atom RI. RJ is another atom in, in the neighborhood. So if we, are if we look at these quantities, they're automatically translation and rotational invariant. And if you look at these quantities, they're automatically rotation, uh, so permutation invariant. So we're going to design a network that only uses the quantities of this type. So automatically, it has to be translation and rotation and permutation invariant. So here's the, what's happening. This is a very dense, uh, uh, busy slide. So for each, <coughs> I said for each atom, there's a sub-network for each atom. The input is just the neighbors in this for that little atom. But each sub-network has two parts. One is the encoding part, one is the fitting part. The encoding part generates many, many functions of this type, of this quantity. So therefore, the output of the encoding part are, uh, are symmetry preserving quantities. And we make sure that there's enough of those. And the fitting part is the neural network that fits the energy and the force. So that's what's going on in these sort of slides. And as a matter of fact, it seems that these filters in the first encoding part seem to have some sort of interpretation. So I'm not going to talk about it um, too much here. But in a way, this is a, a, a very um, smooth, and it makes sure that all the symmetries are preserved. So this is the first part. This part is like sequential learning. You give me the data, then I produce a neural network that fits the data. The second part is that, quick yes? Um, it seems like you're suggesting the smooth version is energy preserving. Is that somehow enforced, or is that just? You no, know, it's not enforced. So this is, this is the result. Oh. This is very sensitive. Got to give it a. This is the uh, producer with the, the with the smooth part with the smooth version. But, but is that guaranteed to be energy preserving, or is it just happened oh. to be energy preserving? <coughs> it happened to be energy preserving by looking at it. There's no. It's if you want to prove it, then that depends on how your MD schemes looks like. Your belay, I mean, it's not exactly energy, energy preserving. All that sort of stuff. Thanks. Uh, that's about, when you say you're training about the energies and the forces, are you training them as separate learning targets, or are you like training with the energy? In the loss function, there's a part that's energy, and another part that's force. And these coefficients are tuned to, you know, adaptively as training goes on. But is the force computed as the gradient of the energy? Hmm? Is the force computed as the gradient of the energy? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, so what if there's no data? You just, you want to do aluminum and there's no data. So here's the procedure. This here is what is concurrent coupling, concurrent learning. And we made the name Deep Jane. So 
So I don't know why I went there. I didn't make this, that make up his name, okay? So this is called Deep Potential genera Generator. So here's following this procedure, exploration, labeling, and, and training. So for exploration, we sample, in this case, we sample, you, you, th there are three components. The first is sampling the macroscopic thermodynamic variables, space. And for each one of these variables, you sample the canonical ensemble using the deep MD, we we'll call it deep MD. This is, I think this is made, the name is made up by Roberto Carr, because there's CPMD, there's DPMD. CPMD is a car perinello molecular dynamics. So now it's DPMD, deep potential. Deep potential molecular dynamics. By the way, we call it the potential deep potential. And this was like three years ago when there's not so many deep things yet. But now everything's deep, so this looks a bit, anyway, that's nice. <coughs> and in addition, we also uh, initialize the exploration with a variety of initial configurations, different crystal structures, hexagonal or whatever, cubic, <coughs> that stuff. <coughs> Labeling is just done using WASP, DFT with periodic boundary condition, and the training is the deep potential I just described. Okay, so anyway, you do that. This is, so now, you don't need to generate data first. You just tell me whatever system you're interested in, this procedure will generate data for you. Uh, generate data and generate the model for you. And this, <coughs> to just to show why, how important this procedure is, exploration and lab, <coughs> and this concurrent coupling is. So here are the examples of aluminum, magnesium, and the alloy. And you see these, uh, these are the numbers of configurations explored. For example, look, let's look at this. This Ike 500, this is a 500 million configurations explored, and only this many were labeled. Very small percentage were labeled. Think about it, if you want to label all those, you know, life would be much harder. But you only need those, and the accuracy is just as good. So more, less than 0.005% of, of configurations uh, need to be labeled. Show you some of the results. First of all, <coughs> the potential itself is very accurate. Basically, the accuracy is comparable to a DFT. So for example, this big molecule paradigm, so you, you understand that if it's on a diagonal, it's accurate, right? One, this is like the DFT, this is the predicted. So if it's on a diagonal, it's accurate. So for example, this is, these are small molecules. This is a high entropy alloy with five components. If you want to cook up your empirical potential for this, life will be very hard. <coughs> oxidites, surface materials, and then big molecules. So the, the accuracy here is not so great because the DFT itself, the accuracy is not so great. <coughs> so basically it's comparable to, DF, <coughs> to DFT. So now we have to go to <coughs> work on DFT. <coughs> Secondly, if you look at statistical information, structural information, you know, everything is, <coughs> you, you don't see the difference. There are actually, every curve, there are two curves. You don't see the difference <coughs> between the, <coughs> the DFT result and the DPMD result. <coughs> so now we have <coughs> generated software, open, uh, uh, open source software. So this is a, the deep potential. If you go to GitHub with deep modeling, so we're gonna, this, we, we <coughs> on the deep modeling, there's a whole bunch of software. This is the deep potential. You need, so what, in this case, you need to supply the data and then it generates the potential for you. But now we have a version in which generates the data. This is the concurrent learning. So you just have to tell the system what, tell the software what system you're interested in, and it's gonna do it for you, hopefully, okay? Depending on how hard it is now. <coughs> so for example, we're working on water. Uh, so there's a, a discussion group. That's very important because lots, you know, hundreds of people are talking in this discussion group, and, and they try to improve each other. I think this is the way to go because it's, it shouldn't be the case that each group has to do its own thing. So we just have this open source forum and everybody can contribute and everybody you know, so improves upon each other. <coughs> so this is an, um, uh, uh, an application, namely we are developing what is we think would be the universal model for water. Water is a very difficult system, as you know, and experimental, um, this is the experiment, this is the, fa this is the phase diagram for water. It's supposed to have over 20 phases. I'm not an expert, Roberto Carr is an expert. So it's supposed to have over 20 phases. And the potential we have now generates, you know, very close, qualitative, at least qualitatively close 
<coughs> um, phase diagram, if you compare with what's done before, tip, tip 4P or <coughs> SPCE, you know, it's very, you know, it's quite far from the experimental result. So now the phase diagram we produced, according to Roberta Kai, it's the first time that one can produce qualitatively uh, similar phase diagrams. And this is the details for generating the, the potential for the water. If anybody is into water, we can talk about it. Well, actually, I don't know much about it. So <coughs> and this is the second example, which is the diffusion of lithium in the solid state e electrolyte. So this is a battery. Uh, what is it? Batteries. Lithium-based batteries, right? Nobel Prize several days ago. <coughs> so diffusion of lithium in is, is the key thing for the ele uh, solid state electrolytes in between the cathodes. <coughs> and then before, people can only compute the diffusion coefficient at very high temperature and then try to extrapolate. So for the first time, we can compute diffusion coefficient at room temperature here. And it re compares reasonably well with experiments. That's because we have a system, we have a model which is as accurate as quantum mechanics, but it's much simpler than quantum mechanics, so we can use this model to compute very large systems for a long time. And there's a whole bunch of applications, many, many applications that, that's going on. That's the first example. The second example I want to talk about, uh, okay, the second example I want to talk about is how to, it's like protein folding. So here the thing would be protein folding because you need to explore very high dimensional surfaces, high dimensional spaces, and you need to uh, compute the free energy in that very high dimensional surface. And a well-known example uh, is, called, is a metadynamics developed by Lyo and Perinello. So, <coughs> so here, the objective is to compute the free energy. So let me maybe first say something about the free energy. You have this atomic system that we just talked about. But you don't want to track the dynamics of each atom. You want to look at a coarse grained version of that. For example, that's typically done in um, chemical engineering where you have beads and springs. But you know, how do you get the potential for that beads and springs system, whatever coarse grained system? And how do you do coarse grained molecular dynamics? So this has been a difficult problem for a very long time. So let's just look at the free energy. So free energy is that you, you, you already predefined a set of collective variables. These are coarse grained variables. For example, dihedral angles in a protein or these um, um, okay, these um, Steinhardt, Steinhardt um, or, or Steinhardt variables in a, in a crystal, for example. So these are collective variables. And you want to get the effective potential for that set of collective variables. And the effective potential is called the free energy. The free energy is defined in the following way. So you are integrating over all the microscopic variables that has been coarse grained. Essentially, that's the idea. And then you have the mean force. So this is the free energy. <coughs> this is the sort of concept of free energy and mean force. We want to get this free energy. <coughs> so in, in a way, this is the same problem as before. Before we had the potential energy, now we have the free energy. So the issues are very much similar. <coughs> so metadynamics, which is very well known, does the following. So <coughs> um, the free energy is computed by, you know, you, you are exploring this configurational space over the original configurational space. When you do that, and then you add these, you know, at each point, you add a little Gaussian, and that Gaussian is added to the, the correct free energy, uh, coarse grain variable value of the coarse grain variable, variable. And then these little Gaussians would add up to the free energy. This, this is one idea. The second idea is that you are using the free energy that has computed, which is not accurate, it is not as accurate, but you still use that to help do exploration. So therefore you have a little, if you added a little Gaussian here, your, free, your en, uh, potential energy doesn't look like this, it looks like this. So this bottom is raised up a little bit, so therefore you get less get stuck 
here. When you add up to here, then there's this well is removed. So therefore, you don't get stuck at this well at all. So this is the idea of um, metadynamics. And this is a little bit like what I was emphasizing about exploration. OK, so, so now we, <coughs> we could cut something called reinforced dynamics. We call it reinforced dynamics because there's an analogy with the re reinforcement learning. But that's not the point I want to make here. <coughs> so this, again, has three parts, exploration, labeling, and training. And <coughs> the, the part about exploration is the following, that you are, exp you are exploring with a modified potential energy by adding this part. So this is a little bit like the uh, uh, metadynamics, except that there is a sigma here. So A is the free energy you computed so far, which is not necessarily accurate. Because it's not necessarily accurate, we're going to switch on and off of this biasing part, depending on how confident we are about the accuracy. So this sigma here is a, and a sort of activation function, which activates this term if we are very Com very, ac very, very comfortable about it, very confident about it. If we are not so confident, we just switch that off. So you should notice that because we are now not doing these little Gaussians, we're doing a neural network model, so that's more global. So that term is important to switch on and off. If, you, if, you, you know, if you're here and you got something really wrong and you still use that as a biasing, that, that wouldn't be good. Okay, so and then <coughs> decide how, you know, once you see a configuration and you need to decide whether you need to have that label, namely compute the mean, uh, the potential mean force in order to compute the free energy. And that decision is done by this little trick I mentioned earlier, namely consum having an ensemble of networks and compute the variance of their predictions. If the variance is big, you have that labeled. If it's small, you don't have that labeled. And labeling is done. So labeling, you need to compute the mean, potential mean for, uh, 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 <coughs> potential mean force, and that's done by restraining molecular dynamics. <coughs> yes. So when you compute the variance here, some of the data will be coming from biased sampling, right? When the activation function has been switched on. Yeah. Are you going to reweight the variance to take that into account? Pardon me. The variance, that you have. Uh, the variance, no. The variance is just whatever you've computed. But it have been com it, it could have, so it's being computed under the effect of a bias ensemble. Yeah. Is, is that really fair? Because you would have liked to look. That, that could be misleading, for example. That could be systematic. Don't you think that would be systematic effect? No, I, no I'm, only, I'm just trying to compute that. I just need to compute this. Integral, right? As long as I have enough terms in this integral, I'm, I'm fine. Fair enough, but I'm comparing with your previous one, the interactive potential. Right? Yeah. When you computed the variance, the data was inherently unbiased. No, the, the, the variance is the variance between the, the different um, neural networks. I'm training five neural networks on the fly, not just one. And the variance is just between the five neural networks. Yes, but it's. Is it a Boltzmann weighted variance or not? No, no, just. Just the straightforward variance. I'm just comparing five numbers. You know, whether if they are all the same, I'm good and it's happy. So don't do any labeling. If they're all over the place, then label that. <coughs> yes. Um, so you said that sigma is, is switched on and off depending on the accuracy. Of yes. A. But uh, is it the accuracy of A or the accuracy of the gradient of A? Because they they can be very different. Gradient. Oh, I see. Yes. <coughs> OK, so the advantage of, of this kind of ideas compared with uh, metadynamics is that now we can work with many collective variables. So many metadynamics is limited to you know, less than 10 collective variables. So in that case, you really have to make sure your collective variables are really the right collective variables. If you want to look at some sort of a reaction, and the collective variables is not the right reaction coordinate, and then you're, really, then you're really in serious trouble. So now we can handle many collective variables, so we, can, we don't have to be careful with, so careful with ch the choice of the collective variables. So for example, this is, is a trivial system, the triapeptide, and, <coughs> okay, so. 
and um, I forgot what was coarse grain here. Okay, anyway, tripeptide. So this is a um, mathematician's version of a protein. Namely, you, take two, you put 10 or 11 type um, alanine, I think. And then, yeah, alanine 10 with 20 collector variables, so the two dihedral angles find psi. And this is a 20 dimensional um, configuration space, and you can look at, enumerate all the metastable states <coughs> now. And you can use that for proteins. So this is a little protein with 20 amino acids. There are 38 um, collector variables. This is the initial configuration, and this is the folded structure. So we haven't really worked very hard on this, but I think if you do, you can do this with hundreds of collector variables. And this really, um, opens up r a lot of possibilities, but we haven't really worked very hard on this. So this, uh, with this, you can now do coarse grain molecular dynamics. Yes. So before you go on, the, when you're using the variance to select the examples to label, yeah. are you selecting one example at a time, or are you selecting many examples? No, just that particular configuration. But the, and then you label it, and then you recompute the variance, so you're doing one at a time selection, or do you, do you, do you, do you you then you do the loop. Then you do the whole loop. Right, but it's one at a time. You don't have a back. Okay, so that so that sort of that can be debated, right? That you that's a little that's some. Um, you you maybe you you labeled and you don't like train with each new label added. You can wait for a little batch and then retrain. But then you have a you have a covariance problem with the variance. Of that could be yes, that could be. So certainly there is a lot of algorithmic issues one could uh, think about. You do the restraint. So suppose this is a collector variable that we want to label. And then you do sort of a restrained molecular dynamics to make sure. Umbrella sampling with the collector variable? Yeah. <coughs> so then you can do coarse grain MD. Um, anyway, so this is a coarse grain MD with, uh, this is, I think it's also for water. <coughs> and you can see that, you know, you really got this kind of very good accuracy by the standards of coarse grain MD. <laughs> <coughs> so if you really have to read the literature of coarse grain MD to appreciate that this is good accuracy. <coughs> okay, so the last example is um, kinetic model for gas dynamics. So this is gas dynamics. The important quantity, you know, these are gases. Mole gas molecules collide with each other. An important quantity is the Knudsen number, which is the mean free path. That's, you know, the pass between, between collisions and the macroscopic system size. So that's a Newton number. If the Newton number is very small, how big is the Newton number in this room? Does anybody know? Okay, I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it's supposed to be small because here we're supposed to be able to use Euler's equation. So this is, then it's, we're just looking at density, velocity, and temperature. And if you up there, you know, in the sky, the Newton number could be very big, then you really have to use, look at the collision of the atoms and use Boltzmann equation. And if you're designing for shuttle, and then you have to look at the, the whole regime when, with a small and large Newton number. So the Boltzmann equation looks like this, where you have this Newton number here, epsilon is not necessarily small, and you have the collision term, and the collision term is a rather complicated integral operator. So, so this is the Boltzmann equation. And Euler's equation is obtained when you take in the epsilon going to zero limit. In that case, we just have to look at these zeros order, first order, and second order moments, a uh, trace of the second order moments of that distribution function. So F is the phase-based distribution function. So we, we get a closed system for these low order moments, and that's Euler's equation. And this looks like this for ideal gas. This is how Euler's equation look like. So this is great for epsilon small. Now, people have thought of for a long time about extending this set of ideas to large values of epsilon. So this is the moment closure problem. Started, as far as I know, it started from Harvard grad at Kurang Institute in the 1940s. So here is the idea. 
basically you want to extend this to more moments. So you, you, you started with finite dimensional linear sp sp uh, space of functions, polynomials usually, of V. So these are generalized moments, permitted polynomials usually. And you expand the function using these bases. And then <coughs> with this expansion, in the end, you have a closure problem. As always, you have a closure problem because lower moments, moments, the equation of lower moments involves higher moments, higher moments, even, even higher moments. And at some point, you have to close off that thing, that hierarchy. So this is the closure problem. And then just truncate it, usually, at higher orders. So this is the moment closure uh, scheme that has been you know, pursued for a very long time. The problem with this is that there are two problems. One is that the equation you obtained is not necessarily hyperbolic. For example, Grad's 13 moment system is not hyperbolic in t at some of these places. And secondly, that the accuracy is not guaranteed because you did this closure by truncating or by something else. You know, there's no guarantee of the accuracy. <clears throat> so now we know that we want to do this with machine learning. What else do we do, right? So <coughs> we do this in two steps. The first is to learn the moments through an autoencoder. Okay, so here you want to find the optimal set of W so that, um, so that once you get, so that the moments, so W is now a general function, not necessarily polynomials anymore. So, <coughs> so that the generalized moments created by this W function best represents the original distribution function. In other words, if you reconstruct the original distribution function using only W, the accuracy is maximized. So this is how we generate generalized moments. And then once you decide what these generalized moments are, boy, what? Yeah, once you decide what, you then try to get the dynamic equation for the generalized moments. Well, this is the W, the new moments. This is the old one. You have these fluxes and source terms. For some reason, empirically, we've found that it's much better to do this. Namely, you should take into account the Euler part. The Euler part corresponds to local max waning, that the distribution function is close to local max waning. And then do this. This seems to be a very good variance reduction algorithm. You know, the data you only generate are kind of noisy. And by doing so, the variance is greatly reduced. So what are the issues? Well, again, symmetry is important. So since now we are talking, look, looking at a dynamical problem, before when we did the fit the functions, those were static problems. So the symmetries are you know, the usual symmetries. This is a dynamic problem. So there's one, at least one additional symmetry, which is the Galilean invariance. <coughs> so that's one issue. Secondly, how do you generate the data? Thirdly, how do you, <coughs> you, if you want these models to be really like your PDEs, not just in the algorithm, <coughs> how do you, select the training algorithm, the, the, the neural network model, <coughs> local versus non-local. OK, so this is the whole procedure, which is just the same as before, active, uh, uh, what is called um, <coughs> concurrent learning. And now exploration. So explore, this is a poor man's exploration. I, I want to emphasize, how do we do exploration here in the best way? It's not it's clear. So this is a poor man's exploration. What do we do? We cook up a set of random initial conditions that are made up of waves, random waves, separated by shocks. Because this problem, we have to deal with shocks. Okay? <clears throat> and and labeling is just solve the kinetic equation, Boltzmann equation. And then the training part, as I said, we have to take into account, besides the usual the invariance and conservation laws, we have to take into account the invariance. OK, this is just to give an example how to get any variance. We choose the moments to look, uh, these functions w to look like this. This removes the Galilean variance. And then everything works out. This is a simple idea, a trivial idea, you could say, that we took a long time to figure, you know, figure out that this is important. So if you don't do this, then you need lots of data. If you do this, the data needed is greatly reduced. <coughs> Show you some results. This is. Um, we take the Newton number to be a random variable selected from this distribution, log distribution, log, uh, log normal distribution, log uniform distribution. And then um, this is from 10 to the minus 1 to 10 to the 3, or something like that. And then we, we uh, for the additional 
um, generalized moments, we select nine. Again, this is sort of done by hand. And then um, for, the, um, for the microscopic model, the Boltzmann equation, we use the model with the Maxwell molecules. By the way, even though there's been a long time where people look at moment closure, it seems that there's not a single moment closure created for realistic models, namely a Maxwell molecule. That doesn't even exist. We try to compare with the existing models, couldn't find it. <coughs> so these would be results of density. I think density, what is it? De energy, momentum, density at the initial condition, later time, and even later time. And then the green, there are three curves here. This orange curve is just if you solve all the equation, and you know it's not going to be very good. And then the green curve, green curve is solving the moment generator. The, the, the machine learning based model. The epsilon value here is 8.10, not small. Uh, 8.1, not small. And then there's a um, blue curve, which is the solution to the Boltzmann equation. You don't see much of a difference because in this particular example, actually, there is a difference here. There is blue and, and, and green that you see. <coughs> but overall, this is a typical example that we've seen, the overall the accuracy is very good. Another example, same thing, but this time the epsilon changes across the domain just to mimic transitional regime. So this is the, the results, we have. this is how the generalized moments look like for a different set of, so they're, they're not polynomials. So this is part of the uh, problem is not as complete as the one we did before, so there's a lot of work to be done in order to make this really practical and for everybody to be able to use there's still a lot of work need, that needs to be done. Paper just got accepted. So co to conclude, there are other possibilities of concurrent learning. For example, if you want to solve PDEs, you have a PDEs in front of you, Hamid Jacobi Bellman equation. There's no data beforehand. And then you, need, you can cook up this kind of current, concurrent lear, uh, learning procedure to generate the data and learn at the same time, interactively. Model-based reinforcement learning. Here, model-based means really model-based. Reinforce, reinforcement learning, when they say model-based, typically it's model-free, but they also talk about model-based. But what they mean is that they first learn a model and then use the model-based. But here, when I say model-based, if, you, you know, if you have some dynamical system in front of, you, front of you, and you really can use that details of the dynamical system to do reinforcement learning. And again, this is a problem that starts, starts out with, with no data. And this interactive process should be helpful, uh, especially when the, the model is sort of reasonably complicated. <coughs> so exploration is not, exploring the state space is not so easy. Okay, essentially any time you have a code or simulator to generate that states and data, you can use this concurrent coupling. Concluding remarks, concurrent learning is a very powerful tool. DBM details, okay, I already said, said these, but I want to say that these are models, not just algorithms, but these models can be, then be used to do sequential model scaling. So they are, these are concurrent learning, but then sequential model scaling models. P please get this straight. <coughs> and the methodologies are quite general, and it's important to take around symmetries and physical constraints. And so how do we think about these models, which part of it is just a neural network? So this is, what I, this is the example that I know when I was a graduate student here when we had to solve oil equations with complex gases. The equation of state is not just ideal gas. And in that case, the equation of state, if I remember correctly, I still, is stored as a table in Los Alamos. So here is the same thing. You have the equation, and part of it is stored in a table somewhere. Okay. Basically, but you can think of it as just as a PDE. I think that's important. <coughs> okay, this is my ad advertising slide. So we are starting a new conference. This is called Mathematical and Scientific Machine Learning. Stan and I are in the scientific board. And the first conference is going to be Princeton, organized by pr two Princeton alumni, Jan Fong Lu and Rachel Ward. Going to be happening next summer. And this is the most important part. If you have a good paper, please submit before November 30th. That's all I want to say. Thank you. <coughs>